Welcome to Social Genius, brought to you by Drunk on Social, where we help you stay ahead of social media trends, share the latest news, and highlight the strategies that are working to help you grow your business. Now let's join our hosts, Tristan and Jeff, in three, two, one. Does all this social media knowledge, strategies, and skills from this podcast really matter if you don't use video? The truth is any presence is better than no presence, but without video, you're really limiting your growth. It's no secret that video is the future of all media. It's where all consumers gravitate, so executing at a higher level than your industry peers is an absolute necessity to create differentiation. You can hire a full-time videographer, but is that really sustainable? The answer is no for many, which is why it is critical that you adopt and learn video skills to allow you to create video that will stand out. Having camera presence, knowing what equipment to use and how to use it, proper lighting, video editing, music and voiceovers, scripting, and many other topics are the reason why Business Video School was created. To teach you how to develop these skills quickly and easily with over-the-top support along the way so that you never feel lost. The Business Video School is a comprehensive video education platform that delivers all of this training, but also creates actual video recipes with instructions and scripts for you to execute relevant content weekly with all of the skills you learn. And it doesn't stop there. Regular video challenges, weekly Q&As, a real estate video roadmap, a community of people learning and experimenting with video, and so much more. Seriously, what are you waiting for? Why wouldn't you join the Business Video School today? Go to www.bizvideoschool.com forward slash open dash house and register for the next open house where you'll you'll learn more and get a chance to hear from current students and even ask them questions. That's bizvideoschool.com. Check it out. Let's get started. So, so uh, Tristan, I'll go ahead and lead this in because you've interviewed Brendan like 10 million times. Some of you may or may not have, have watched Brendan, and we just keep having him back because it's so good, and he's constantly evolving his content. We interviewed him on the first Social Genius. He's been on Lab Code Agents, I think, more than once. He's been on uh, Success Podcast. I just listened to that one twice. And uh, I, I frankly just, I love listening to you, Brendan. You obviously put out great stuff. One of my favorite quotes is, you know, content doesn't go viral because of luck. It goes viral because of science. And we are going to break that down today. So if you don't know Brendan, uh, he has, he's got tons of accolades, a best, best-selling author of 1 million followers, how I built a, so, a massive social audience in 30 days, and Hook Point, how to stand out in a three-second world. He has managed brands uh, for people like Taylor Swift, Rihanna, uh, Adriana Lima, uh, to name a few. And you guys are doing some amazing things. I think the amount of views that you guys have created, you've generated, what, 60 billion views and over 100 million followers uh, as a result of Hook Point. So welcome, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your patience. And uh, uh, Tristan, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, have a few words and we'll get going. No, I'm just happy to do this, Brandon. I'm, I'm happy that it happened. Your background, though, is different. Where the hell are you? In London, it's different every time I speak to you. I am finally getting a permanent base after a year of figuring out where I'm going to be. So hopefully it should be solidified next time we talk and not nice. ever changing. <laughs> okay, man. Okay. Well, what are you what are you excited about for the rest of these two and a half months, 2022, that that has per, that pertains specifically to social media because so much happens, so much changes, and we're seeing that each of the social platforms is now trying to copy each other. I mean, yesterday, TikTok announced that now they're going to allow pictures, and we've seen that over the last two weeks too. So it's interesting, man. What are you excited about then? I mean, I would say monetization. Um... For example, YouTube Shorts, you know, talked about the revenue share now uh, as as one thing, and then also uh, Instagram is, you know, launched subscriptions for their in a, in kind of like a competition with OnlyFans, even though OnlyFans skews to a different audience. But I I think that those two things are exciting for me because again, it just gives creators more opportunity to make creating content sustainable. Uh, 
and, and just make a business out of the content they create, or at least offset the expense that it costs to create content. So to me, I think that that's an interesting thing. Um, I find that more fascinating than, you know, really the, the, um, the new features to compete against each other, um, mm -hmm. which are happening all the time, but, uh, Anything that can support creators over the long term to create more content is is interesting to me. Do you think because of that, we're going to see YouTube succeed with short video way more, way better than TikTok? Because that's what Mr. Beast says. There's no way with the amount of money that creators can make off of short video on YouTube that YouTube doesn't win this this battle. What do you think? Um, I, well, first off, YouTube is one of our clients, so I have to be kind of <laughs> careful of what I can kind of say or not say with it. But, um, I'm just, I, 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 I'm bullish on YouTube from the fact that they have the one thing that all the other platforms wish they had, which is long form consumption behavior. Uh, and they've obviously had that from day one and all of the other platforms would die for that. And it's interesting that they are, you know, focused so heavily on, on short form, but Listen, do I believe that um, that that revenue share offers a tremendous opportunity for YouTube? Yes. But if you look at the volume of content, most content creators, 99% of content creators out there are never going to reach the volume of views to actually make a meaningful profit off of it. So I think it is an interesting attraction model for, you know, top TikTok influencers and potentially migrating them over. I mean, it's kind of similar to what happened with vine and vine stars and, and and getting them over to to instagram um with video now monetization wasn't in play but you know those those vine stars saw opportunities in, in growing their brands further on other platforms so uh i think that mr beast has always been spot on on him he's one of the smartest you know influencers and content creators on the planet um but as you've seen with TikTok, it's just going to come down to how they evolve with you know, supporting their creators and their ecosystem because they could either turn around and 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 get really aggressive in supporting their content creators, or they can fall by the wayside in in, in the way that Snapchat did and and not really care about their influencers and kind of piss them off in causing them to leave to other platforms. So I think it's really up to TikTok now to see how they they evolve and adapt to to these changes as well. Well, I want to. I wanted. To, I wanted to add too. When you mentioned monetization, the uh, Facebook's got their community summit this Friday too, and they're they're going to be talking about more monetization for Facebook groups. Uh, so Tristan, that's especially interesting to you uh, mm -hmm. because they're going to be adding more monetization to Facebook groups. So it's really interesting. And, and Tristan and I talk about this a lot. How these platforms are all just kind of duking it out and 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 battling each other, which is going to be to the benefit of creators because they've all got to they got up their game because YouTube just kills everyone in, in terms of monetization but but segueing away from that conversation brendan back to what we what the original quote that i mentioned was which is this is a science and and you know everything that you teach is about you know virality and, and gaining 1 million followers right and, and how do you hook your audience in but by and large most of this audience including ourselves uh you know and including probably even most of your audience the end goal isn't necessarily virality. It's it's uh, kind of talking about what you what you say in, in your latest uh, write up the, the the hook point that you sent us about understanding how the algorithms work. And so as we talk about that, and and you talk about when you talk to your clients, because you're talking to a very high end client ultimately. You, YouTube is a client. That's you know, that's, that's, we're, we're talking to individuals here who just want to grow their business and understand how to tap in, create more connections, create more conversations, create more business, not necessarily creating a 2 million view video, but creating, you know, a, a sustainable business plan. How do you talk to that person? Like, what is your mindset around growing your business with social media? Because you're, probably one of the, the pinnacles of, of, of experts on this topic. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And the honest answer is it's no different um, because the process is the same. And, and just to give you a prime example, and we can get into the processes, we were working with um, an Italian leather wallet company 
and it was just like one founder that was creating content. Maybe he had a few people supporting the business, but we supported him um, in growth on TikTok. And he grew from, I think, basically nothing on TikTok to 150,000 followers. And he's got like three million to 2 million views. And he sold out of inventory. Um, and he's doing over six figures a month in revenue now. Damn. So like, that's kind of the power. And when we talk about virality, virality can mean any, many different things. For some people, it's, hey, we're stuck at 100 views of video. How do we get to 1,000? Or from 1,000 to 10,000 or 10,000 to 100,000 or 100,000 to a million or all the way up. I mean, we were just working with an influencer uh, and I can't remember. He's, at, I think, four or five million subscribers and doing millions of views per video. And we were even uh, supporting him in using the same system that we used for the, the leather wallet entrepreneur. So to me, it's like, if you're going to put energy and time into content, why not have the right effective process and reach the most amount of people possible? Um, what I, where I think you're going, Jeff, is there's virality is that it's a word that's thrown around a lot. And I think a lot of people think about virality as, you know, just doing anything to get views you know, a, a prank video, a trend, a song or anything like that, just to get views and not playing to the fundamental core of what your brand or business stands for. We don't do any of that. Everything is about how do we take your zone of genius, your expertise and contextualize it for the widest possible audience. And the interesting thing is anything can be made to go viral. You know, um, I know we've talked about in the past is like, you know, you guys are well-versed in real estate. Ryan Serhant has made real estate go viral. And you talk about somebody that has a very narrow audience of who his core client is, but he knows how to make it go viral so that he's built a larger brand in real estate than basically any other real estate agent on the market. And he's selling, you know, I think he's representing the most expensive property in the world right now, like $250 million penthouse in New York. You have like Dr. Mike that has made medical um, Dr. Julie Smith, a clinical psychologist that's made clinical psychology go viral, um, clear value tax made taxes go viral. So from, so from my perspective, it's, um, it's not about going viral for the sake of going viral. Obviously you have to have a, a fundamental business strategy and, you know, content strategy that supports your goals. But, but to me is if you're going to put the time, energy, and effort into producing content, you know, why not maximize that effort and that output to get in front of as many people as possible to exponentially, you know, grow your brand or, or your business. That makes a lot of sense, man. What do you think that agents, the normal agent out there is you're exposed to real estate a lot because of where we've placed you and then where you kind of fit in as well, because this is our audience. Where do you say, what do you say to agents that want to succeed in social, not necessarily go viral, but just succeed in using it? What, what are some tips that you can give as far as that? Well, I think that we can go back to talking about Ryan Serhan and what, is, what does he do, do so well? Uh, first and foremost, he's telling a story about a property that anybody would be interested in consuming. Well, over a $7 million closet. Let me take you on a two over $250 million ranch. Like anybody would be interested in consuming that content, even though 99% of those people can't afford those properties, but they want to go on that journey with him. They want to see what this property looks like. So yeah, obviously doesn't, everybody doesn't have access to those types of properties, but there's, and I can't remember the name of, there's another guy that actually does the exact same format as Ryan, but he does it better than Ryan. And he gets more views and more subscribers than Ryan with the same format. And it's not with, you know, $7 million closets. It's like two to $10 million homes. But even if you don't have that level of home, it's like, well, what is the story that even if you're doing in a local community, what is the story around this property that anybody would be interested to learn about this home or learn about this neighborhood or whatever it is around there? Because that's, the biggest mistake that any content creator is making is they're just trying to create a piece of content for their core customer. And that automatically narrows the person that's going to stop and scroll, stop the scroll and consume that content or click on that content. And the minute the algorithm see that, they're going to suppress that reach. So 
even if somebody's not in the market of buying a home, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't want to consume the content. And if they consume that content, that also doesn't mean that they can't refer business to you or keep you in the back of your head. And that's where like Ryan has succeeded. And the reason he got a $250 million listing is not because it came right out the gate is he's been working on social for seven, eight, nine years and really getting good at crafting the story that is built his brand reputation that led up to that, that level of, um, listing or or connection brennan is is this the guy you were talking about and is yes yeah. I, and i've heard he now gets paid i think five to ten thousand dollars just to go out and shoot a property so yeah. he's getting free content and getting paid to create the content around the home he flies all over the world now man yeah this is kind of like it's kind of like Tyler Tyler Hassman what he's done for himself and uh, out of Can out of Canada he built it off TikTok same concept and I bet you guys know better real estate agents than him but he is just a good storyteller mm -hmm. and that's what's it's causing it. and that's what's building the brand you know reputation is and and again from a storytelling element he is not you know obviously on a subtextual level you always have to focus on what is going to move the bottom line because again it goes back to how is this going to build our business how is this going to drive revenue for us but what he and Ryan are doing is they're saying hey let me generate a few million views a month and out of those few million views a month less than 1% of that is going to be my core audience but that 1% is going to be so much larger than any other real estate agent because i'm in the millions of views and on top of that, I'm generating millions of views. So my brand is much bigger. I have more validation, more credibility than other agents in my market. So it's playing these two goals at the same time. And it's all because they know how to tell an effective story to make the average person care. Effective stories that make the average person care. That's your job in today's world is how do you make people care? How do you make people care at scale? Dude. So, so let me, let me ask you this. So uh, uh, the way, and you mentioned just earlier about how your, your content, the algorithms might suppress your content. And, and you've mentioned like getting in your zone of genius. And I, I think that's a loose statement in the sense of, a, let's just, again, let's stay in the real estate realm because that's who we're mainly talking to real estate and mortgage. And, and Un helping them understand what that zone of genius is. Because if every real estate professional takes the social media and looks at that zone of genius as very specifically real estate, isn't there a level of dilution that is occurring? And and because when when we are taught, because you taught you, you mentioned Sirhan, which I, he's he's one of the best, but he had a, a unique advantage because he was on he was on million dollar listing. Yeah, right? I don't I, I don't agree with that. Um, a million dollar listing doesn't drive drive performance and reach because again the algorithms only care about one thing and that's user retention, and they're not going to say I'm going to favor Ryan Serhan because he was on TV because I can point to so many people that are on reality TV that don't have large followings. Does it help? Sure. But it doesn't help the algorithms. The algorithms aren't looking at it and be like, oh, Ryan Serhant was on this reality show. So we're going to distribute his content to more people than are following him. So it's like, that's like the $250 million ranch tour, I think is like 8 million views. And he's got like a million, 2 million subscribers. It's like, that is driving yeah. success because that story is so good. And, it, and you know, I can point to, and, and what was the guy's name? Tristan Elias. It's uh, Ennis. Ennis, Ennis. Yilma there. Yeah, yeah, he was a nine million dollar listing, and he's using the exact same format. And this is, and we can get into this. This is why we pay so attention to research to inform our content decisions. Ennis is performing oftentimes better than Sirhant, and he wasn't on million dollar listing. He is taking this format and this storytelling mechanism to do this. And Jeff, you brought up a great point: is well, if everybody has that expertise, isn't it going to dilute it because everybody's going to be doing the same thing? And the answer is no, because there's so much nuance into making this good. Let's take an analogy of TV and film, because I would assume everybody tuning into this watches television and film, but there are so many films and TV shows produced just because you can produce a television or, or film. Does it mean it's good? Does it mean people will pay attention to it? No, a lot of them fail. 
This is why Netflix spends $17 billion a year on content because they don't know which content is going to hit. They don't know which is going to be their next Stranger Things or Squid Games. So just because you have the mechanism to create a TV show or a film doesn't mean it's going to be successful. The same thing with what we're talking about here with real estate agents. Just because we look at Ryan Serhanter and as most people are going to overlook what's actually driving the success. It's not because Ryan is touring a $250 million ranch. It's the way that he's touring it. It's the way that he's telling that story. It's the way that he's bringing people on that journey. There's so much nuance in terms of how he's doing it. And the same thing, again, going back to film as we all watch comedy movies, but there's so much nuance into how you craft a comedy of one that you say, that's the best movie I've ever seen. And one and another one, it could be the worst movie you ever seen. And they all follow the same three act structure, hero's journey, and it's a comedy, but polar opposite ends of the spectrum. Does that make sense? It totally does, man. It totally does. I'm answering a question that has to do with. This. Well, and I'm glad I answered. I'm glad I asked it and brought it up because I, I know how our audience does think. And there's always a, some level of limiting belief or objection in their own mind as to why I can't do it at that level. I, I mean, Tristan and I are, are at, a, at a minuscule level in comparison to a Sirhant. And we get asked that question. What, I just had it in, a, we just had a message today. I think she's on here. She says, when do you and Tristan sleep? Because the perception is that we're constantly creating, we're constantly doing these things. And so that question alone makes me believe that there's already a thought that I can't live up to that level because they must be working 24 seven. And so that's kind of, I'm, although I'm glad you, I'm hundred percent glad you corrected me or, or told me you disagree with me because I, I want to eliminate that belief set that you, anyone on this, listening to this, watching this is not capable of doing something similar. Maybe, yeah, you're not going to be Sirhan. Correct. Just like I'm not going to go shoot a basketball and be Michael Jordan. Right. But you do have, you, you do have the capability of doing something amazing for your business. And I think that's the understanding that you help people understand, because again, it goes back to you just said it. It's an algorithm. The algorithm doesn't give a crap that Sir Hant was on Million Dollar Listing. doesn't mean anything, right? It's how he creates what he creates. So I'd love to continue this conversation. Yeah, I mean, like I can give you, and, and this is an interesting thing, uh, and, and I don't want to dive too deep into it, but just to kind of um, solidify that point is oftentimes we do talk about when social drive success versus external factors are driving it. So what does that mean? Like, look at Apple, for example. Like, I think they've got like 20 million subscribers on YouTube. It's some crazy number. But you look at the average views, the average views are horrible. They're like 10,000, 50,000. Why is their subscriber base so large? Well, because Apple's spending $100, $200 million a year marketing Apple off the platform that drives that level of success. The same thing with like The Rock. He's one of the most followed people on Instagram. People say, well, that's driven by organic. No, it's not. It's because every movie that he's in, they're spending $100, $150 million marketing it. He's on the cover of every magazine, TV show, promoting it. And that doesn't dilute like what he's doing, but that those a lot of those external factors are driving those kind of massive results. But again, to your point, Jeff, is the, the beauty of social is we all have these things in our pocket. So we, we have the ability to create the same level of content. Now, the challenge is there's 4 billion other people with these things in their pocket, and they can click a button and post content. So just because you can post it doesn't mean there isn't thought required in terms of doing it. So that's where it's, it's in, in creating content, there, there has to be an understanding of what works, what doesn't work, and why to fuel that. Because if we just keep posting and we're not learning anything, then yeah, we won't reach that that level. But yes, anybody can can reach those levels if they they want to. You know, we we see it time and time again. It's just whether you're actually going to take the time to study and understand what what drives that level of success. Well, and I love what you said too about you know we, we, as we were talking about virality too. It's all it's all contextual right? Like, like you, if you have a thousand Instagram followers and you're getting 500 views and a hundred comments on that is viral be, based on your percentages of, of who you have. And I think that's kind of the name of the game. 
but also you, you mentioned like you are capable of getting those views. And if you're going to take the time to create the content. So as you discuss that, like taking the time to create the content, what is your advice for listeners who have these limiting beliefs as to what they're capable of doing as to how they should approach this process of creating that content and creating Sir Hant level content, even though they may have limited resources, they might just have a cell phone and a lav mic and a, and a tripod. Like that doesn't, that should, that doesn't mean you can't create quality content. A hundred percent. I mean, it, and again, it comes down to the format, like Sir Hans formats different than like a Dr. Julie Smith. I mean, Sir Hant has a guy following him around shooting that content versus Dr. Julie Smith is setting up a camera in front of her with a mic and, 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 and creating that same with like Graham Stefan who does really well on, on YouTube. Like, I, I don't know if he's still doing all of it himself, but for years he would shoot and edit all the videos himself. He didn't have any team or anything. He did it. He did it on his own. Uh, I think the best example on that, I'm sorry, just so that we capture this is um, uh, Casey Neistat. Yes. I mean, is there a better example than somebody just doing all the shit by himself and blowing up? That's just the perfect example. So people, I, mean, I think, have to deal with this limiting mindset that they can't do it, right? It's just that they don't they don't put enough urgency on it. That's why they just don't want to do it. Yeah, it, it, and it's also it's like anything in life. It's work. It's it, you know you got to put in put in put in the time and the energy to to get good at it. And it's whether you're willing to to put in that time and energy to do it, but. You know, uh, Jeff, to your question, I, I think the first place to start is push everything aside. Don't even think about producing a content, opening a camera, filming or anything. Just start by studying the people that are having success and understanding what's driving the success. In addition, looking at the content that is not successful and comparing the two against each other. And through that process, you'll start learning, but also through that process, it should excite you to create content. If it doesn't, then maybe you shouldn't be on social media and creating content. And I'm not saying that and, and putting people down, like you do not have to be on social media necessarily to, to be successful in business. Does it help you? Does it significantly increase your chances of being successful? Absolutely. Um, but I'm not one of these people that are gonna say you have to be on social to be successful. Um, it, again, it significantly increases your chances of, of success. But uh, again, it's like our, the reason that our team has done 60 billion views and 100 million followers for the projects we've worked on is our process is fundamentally deeply rooted in research, which means we have a team of analysts every single day that are analyzing um, influencers, content creators, brands, viral formats, and dissecting the creative nuances that are causing that content to be successful in addition to the reasons that other people are trying to do the same thing and being and not being successful with it. So that's the first place is it, like, if you think about it from like, if you've ever started in music, what do you do is like, you don't start music by just start composing your own music. Like if you're learning the piano, you don't just start, sit down and start playing original music. You learn to play other people's music that came before you. So you learn the fundamentals of it before then you, before you break the pattern of creating your own. Um, unfortunately with, you know, social media again, because anybody can just open up their, their phone and start clicking a video. There's not much thought that's put into it. So they're not forced to go and study um, other content. It's like I started in the film industry and at the time people were still shooting on film. So you had to go to film school to learn the, learn the fundamentals of what it means to create a story and, um, you know, film, film things and edit things and produce and direct. Uh, and, and again, you have to learn these principles of what it means to make something successful and what are the things that can detract from that level of success. And the same thing applies to creating content for this medium. That's why our company's sole focus is providing this research and insights for content creators so that they can understand of what takes a Ryan Serham, what are the, those creative nuances that he's doing to drive that success or Dr. Julie Smith or, or a Graham Stephan. Um, and the way that we, we look at it that's distinctly different than most people is most people are focusing on the concept of trends. 
And trends is a, a bit of a, a dangerous thing if you just look at it from what we call the iceberg analogy. It's like the, the analogy of the tip of the iceberg is above the water, which is the 1% of the iceberg, and then below is 99% of it. That's the same thing with a trend is people talk about a trend and they only look at the 1% at the top being successful, but they don't look at the 99% of people below that are not having success. And that success for, versus unsuccessful is not the trend itself. It's the execution of that trend. It's the creative nuances of, of how that trend is delivered. Like remember the ice bucket challenge way back that went super mm, viral. Well, 99% yeah. of people with the ice bucket challenge didn't have success with it. It was that top 1%, but they thought, oh, because it's a trend and these other people are having success. If I just do the ice bucket challenge, all of a sudden I'm going to go viral. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And I saw, I saw the same trend on a very uh, a smaller scale in the film industry is like you would have like um, a werewolf movie have a huge box office weekend. And then every studio would be like, well, I want to, I want to buy the next werewolf script. And then people would, would produce the next werewolf movies and they would bomb because they think, oh, just this is what people want. No, it's the execution of it. So that's why, again, with the research, what we do is we have a research process that's called gold, silver, bronze. So what we may do is we may take a Graham Stephan account or that format, and we'll look at the gold, the highest performers, the ones that are generating millions of views. But then we'll also look at the silver performers, the, the median, the average, which may be a few hundred thousand, and then the bronze, bronze, the underperformers that may be in the tens of thousands. And what we're doing is we're analyzing the gold, um, the, the high performers, and trying to determine what are those performance drivers? What are those creative nuances? It could be like pacing, tonality, number of edits, first three seconds, um, titles, thumbnails, captions, trying to determine what's driving that success of those high, high performers. But then once we have those hypotheses, then we look in the, the silver and bronze to see if they show up there. Because if they do show up there, then we know that's the reason, not the reason for it to be successful. And we have to start over again until we find those performance drivers in the gold that don't show up in the underperformers. And that's where most people, again, with trends and other things is they're just looking at the successful ones and not analyzing the, the unsuccessful ones to determine what is the difference between the two. Does that make sense? Totally, man. I love that, that you dive into that and do that because a lot of us don't look or don't have the the time because we're working over here or over there to be able to dissect things in that way. But that gives us an insight as to what we should actually be doing as we're scrolling too. It's like, hey, but you told me earlier, I don't know in which one, at which interview, but you said, Tristan, you should be stopping. Every time you stop and you're engaged and you watch that whole video, just think, why did you watch it? What happened at the beginning? What, what made you watch the whole thing? And I'm like, and I started doing that, man. That that on a on a on a one to one level, everybody listening in is something we can all do, right? So yeah, I, I absolutely. Love and and again, what we we do is we do it on a a super granular level so that we can really help our our clients uh, in terms of you know pointing out these these insights because it, you know it's taken us years to master these elements and we just look at these nuanced details that most people ignore or, or don't know to look for. Yeah. What would be the best piece of advice? And, and there's, there's, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about, and then Tristan just took me down the, the uh, hook Avenue, but I wanted to, I wanted to ask you first about, about tr the trending aspect where, and I love how you said that because it's society like changes the way we believe and what we think. Right. And so it's, it's kind of like the whole TikTok hashtag FYP for you page. And, and there, people are still doing it still to this day. They're still doing it as if that's going to hack the algorithm and make their video go viral. And, and you're talking about trending videos and how most uh, creators, anybody who's using a trending video, which we still think is a great idea to build in, you, you don't build a, you don't build an entire a strategy around it, but you think that because one person or five videos got a million views, you use that same sound, you're also going to get a million views. And like you said, 99.9% .9 are going to flop. What, what is, what is your, if coming from your stature, 
and with your clientele, what is what what is your response to? Let's just say I'm a client and I come to you, Brendan, and I'm like, I'm all over these trends, man. I'm jumping on them every second. I'm getting in there. I'm 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 contextualizing them back to my industry, and I'm all over it every single time. What is your advice to somebody? Because a lot of these people on here do the same thing. What is your advice to somebody that is that is that is using that as a piece of their social strategy? Well, to me, it's, are you just jumping on a trend to jump on a trend? Or are you trying to understand why the trend is working and the difference between somebody successfully executing that trend and somebody that's not? Because otherwise you're, let's just say that you, you keep doing that and maybe your success rate is one out of 50 versus if you really put in the energy and the effort, you, your success rate gets one out of four. You know, it's like, it's, 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 are you becoming a better content creator? Are you understanding? It's like, again, going back to film and television, if you just keep producing more films, but not learning what you got right or what you got wrong and how to improve, then what's, what's really the, the purpose to it. So, uh, again, like you can definitely do that, but it's like, if you're going to go after a trend is like, understand the difference between the ones that are doing it successfully or not. Um, and I can also just share like this, and this is kind of a, a, a trend, but this is a format, like people doing these 30 day challenges that we found. So this is our gold, silver, and bronze, you know, gold is the highest performers. Like you see, um, C is the view, view column. Um, and then silver is like the media and, and, and bronze is the, the underperformer. But then what we're doing is we're, we're really looking at, you know, these elements from you know the accessibility, the ease of the challenge, like the novelty of the challenge, whether they're layering in external research, their lighting and composition, um, their storytelling, um, the the challenge length, how long is the actual challenge, to mm. to see what the differences are between this. Because again, you could see this as a as a trend. It's a thirty day challenge, but there's people that are that are generating three to 9 million views and people that are generating 15,000 to 150,000 doing the same exact format. So that's what we're looking at these. And then we, we drive these key takeaways from this research of what's really driving these gold performers so that we have a deep level of understanding of what's causing it to be successful. And, and every time that we do this, Jeff, the better we get so if you want to jump on that next trend, you've learned something about how to tell stories, how to do these elements so that each time you're getting better and better and better at it. And the other interesting part of this is, um, do you really need to constantly be jumping on trends? Like, for example, my friend Alex Stemp, he just hit 20 million followers on TikTok. He's the guy that approaches um, random strangers on the street and offers them professional photo shoots. He's been using the same format for two or three years because he's super good at it and it works. So it's like, once you find yeah. something that works, even like Mr. Beast, like his formats changed slightly, but the still the same storytelling mechanism and hooks are there. They evolve slightly, but he's been riding that for, for, for some time. So it's like, once you really get good at something, you really perfect it and that can take you such a long way. But that's again, like we, that's the process that we do and why our entire, entire company does this for content creators to, to really help support them so that they can pick up on these nuances. That makes so, a lot of sense, dude. So going, going back to where Tristan was going with, with the hooks then and, and leading forward and, and, and Wendy, we'll get to your question, but you know, the hooks, it's like something we've been preaching for years and years and years. And part of it is, is a lot because of what we've learned from you as well. But like you can have the best, uh, you can hire a videographer, you can put out, put together this amazing story. You can put together this just the picture perfect uh, post, if you will. But if you don't grab them in that first second or two, it's it's rendered useless. It doesn't even matter. And, and so talk to that, especially to a real estate audience as to, you know, they know this, but how can they get better at it if they struggle with it? And, and part of it is as well is, you know, once you hit play, everything that you had in your mind is like gone out the window and you get nervous and you freeze up and you say, hey, guys, and you mm -hmm. say happy, 
happy, happy Wednesday, right? Um, so what is your advice to all of what these listeners to how they can elevate their game and, and be better at creating that hook? Because that hook is going to play such an integral part to whether it's a shitty post or an amazing post, that hook is the key component. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, it goes back to what we've been talking about in studying from what's working and what's not working. And I'll give you another example from, from my book, Hook Point. A friend of mine, Craig Clemens, um, created a company called Golden Hippo, and he's probably one of the top copywriters in the world. His company sold $2 billion worth of product through social media ads. Oh, and man. you know when he started out as a copywriter, um, his hooks would constantly get rejected. His boss would say, these just aren't good enough. Uh, and then, so what he started doing is he started finding hooks from the top performing ads out there and put it on a document and then started plugging in his products and services into it so that he can start understanding how to shape his to match the high performers. So again, what he was doing is he was looking at his hooks compared to the high performers and then merging the two as an exercise to understand it. And the same thing applies with social media. That's where you know, we look at a format or a trend and, and, and look at the hooks, look at how they are opening their first three seconds, what their thumbnails, what their title cards, what their captions look like. And then from that, understand how that can be applied. Like the 30 day challenge research that I, I just shared with you, like that can be applied to so many different things. But again, just because you look at 30 day challenge as a hook, it's, and it's a great hook, doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're going to be successful with it. So it is looking at hooks in terms of these formats or these trends, but then looking at the other elements of how you express those hooks to fully complete it, to have that level of success. So I, I know I'm going to sound like a, a broken horse here, but like the, the amazing thing is all the answers are out there and they're available to us through the successes and failures of what's working, what's not working. Um, that's where it's um, really critically important. And again, why we've focused all of our energy and effort in, in, in doing this for, for content creators so they can pick up on it. Um, and I'll just put a link in the chat. We have a viral mastermind um, that, that breaks down this research and insights for people. Because I know, because even some of our agency clients don't have the time to do, like we support some of the largest viral video agency clients on the planet with the research because they don't have the time to do it. So I know when I talk about these research and insights, it sounds like a lot of work and it is a lot of work. That's why we do the work for people. And every week we break it down and share those insights with people. But that's from like the example with Craig Clemens and just from my successes, that's where we've learned the most about how to you know, create these effective hooks is by studying other people in the market. And, and for those of you that are on here, obviously we're getting close to the hour here. We started way late. We built in an extra half an hour, not for this reason, but I'm glad we did for this reason now. Um, <laughs> uh, Brendan, there, so there was a question in the chat. There's been a couple of comments and then there was a question uh, that I'd love to hear your response to this. And, and it goes along the lines of how can I start on a budget? And by budget, I'm going to go ahead and say $0. And, and there's been a couple of people that said, you know, sure, you can. And they, they say they say this to people like us all the time. You guys create so much content because you have teams. And my response to them is always, it didn't start that way. I didn't have a videographer from day one. I didn't have a team from day one. And I just was committed to a process. And, and I realized I was going to suck at it. And then I worked at it and I found out efficiencies. And now I like scripting videos and using a teleprompter because I think I'm pretty good at it. That may not work for everybody, but how, how do you respond? These people hear us tell our story and our process all the time. But the reality is everybody starts from square one. Everybody is born by and large the same way and learns to walk the same way and ride a bike the same way and swim the same way. And, and I think so many people are, are so paralyzed by the high, the high level creators. I can't do that. I don't have what you have. So how do they get started? How do they get over that? What is your reaction or response to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I completely hear what they're saying is, is you just choose a format and a structure that doesn't require all of that. You look at 
Dr. Julie Smith, which we've broken down in our private mastermind. I mean, that's the single camera, her talking to the camera in a single room. I'm pretty sure she films and edits that on herself. And it's TikTok, yep. it's short form content. Um, there's another lawyer, Erica, I think it's Kohlberg, that does this format, two characters, one light bulb, we call it, where it's her on both sides of the screen, um, talking, having conversation with herself. She's, she's she, Her whole thing is she write, reads the fine print of legal things about like airlines yeah. and like Amazon so that you don't have to. She does that on her own. Graham Stephan, again, as I mentioned before, I don't know if he still does everything himself. I'm pretty sure he does because his, his filming and editing haven't shifted. Um, but like, if he, if he doesn't for the first few years, he was creating that on his own. It, it doesn't, it, it, it does feel a lot of work if you're looking at the holistic picture, but like, I would focus on like getting one piece of content done, just do one. And if after you do that one, if you don't want to do it anymore, then you don't. But if you're thinking about, oh, I've got to produce a piece of content every week or four times a month or whatever that is, you're going to overwhelm yourself is just think about just doing one. And find yeah. a format that you like from a content creator that isn't resource intensive. It's you sitting in front of a, a microphone or a desk or something like that that doesn't create all these variables. But, you know, there's another guy, Hunter Prosper, um, that we broke down. Um, I think he's at three or four million followers on TikTok. He approaches random strangers on the street and asks them, an emotionally charged question about like a difficult time in their life or something like that. There's little to no production value in there. He's just going up to random strangers on the street and he's shooting it on his iPhone. So are there people like Mr. Beast that, that have huge production value or Ryan Serhant? Sure. But you don't have to do that. You, you do not have to do that to be successful. So um, I understand the, the, the emotional, overwhelm that can happen if you look at this huge this huge picture this huge landscape but just focus on creating one piece of content at a time and focus on one that doesn't feel daunting or overwhelming but also more importantly focus on one that feels fun to you that you actually enjoy doing which which uh, i love that you just said that because that then leans into authenticity uh, usually if you lean into that authenticity it makes content creation so much easier and so much more fluid and you're going to be more eloquent. Uh, and, and yeah. for so many people, Brendan, it's, it's the, well, if I don't talk about my business, how am I going to get business out of it? You know, yeah, what is your reaction to that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. And, and again, that's where it goes down to studying the best is how do you do it authentically? You watch like a, even Mr. Beast, if you watch his videos of how he authentically you know, first off, if you want to talk about somebody that loves content, Mr. Beast loves creating content and it comes off. But then you also want to talk about how he authentically yeah. works in sponsorships and the ways that he, you know, funds these things or the way that even he sells merch. Like he'll do these crazy live signings where he'll sign, you know, sweatshirt for 30 hours or whatever. Like, or he did the the tree planting one where he raised like $24 million to, to plant 20 million trees. Like, there's ways to authentically do that or the way that Graham Stephan asked people, uh, he says to smash the like button on YouTube. Like, again, there's ways that you can, um, or Erica Kohlberg, the lawyer, she's, you know, it, she has an authentic way of integrating, you know, to follow her account. Like there's authentic ways to, to do it. You don't have to go off selling. And, and you do even see like Ryan Serhant, like heavily selling anything in his videos. No, he's just, doing his level of expertise. So there's yeah. definitely ways to integrate calls to actions in an authentic way that doesn't come off like you're selling things. And I think by the sheer fact of you creating engaging content or reaching more people, it's going to lead to more and more business opportunities for you. True. Brandon, where do people follow you and where do people sign up for anything you've got so they can learn more? Yeah, I think if they're, they're, interested, I, I would go to um, goviral.hookpoint.com. That's where we have our private mastermind where we meet once a week and break down um, the latest influencer viral format uh, research uh, that our company does. You can access past ones, um, but that's where we really dive into these nuances and in, 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 in the research where they get access to us and our team and can ask questions and things of that nature. Um, they can also go to hookpoint.com to connect with us directly or uh, I do respond to direct messages on Instagram at Brendan Kane and on LinkedIn as well. 
Perfect. I love it, man. Thanks for joining us this morning. Sorry for being late, uh, but we made it happen. Jeff, it's all Jeff's fault, Jeff. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. It's not Jeff's fault. <laughs> Uh, thanks no comments. No we, comment. We appreciate and then I, I want to give you the chance to kind of just share some parting thoughts. Uh, obviously, we kind of bounced all over the place, but I think this has been valuable. Uh, what, what are some parting thoughts that you have? Yeah, I think that, you know, Jeff, you brought up an important point. I, I think if you're just feeling overwhelmed with it, just create one piece of content. You know, there's a great book out there that I recommend um, by BJ Fogg uh, called Tiny Habits. Yes, uh, I had the pleasure of, of studying under him for, for several years. He created the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University, uh, taught the founders of Instagram at Stanford prior to them funding Instagram. But it talks a lot about success momentum and taking tiny habits to shift you know, major things in your life. And I think that if you are getting overwhelmed with this process is just take one step, just take one step at a time and, and, and go from there. I love it. Thanks, yeah. guys. Brendan, looking forward to the next time we get to connect, hopefully in person in LA. Uh, and and uh, also thank you looking all. for new place. Uh, I, I want a new background, Brendan. Uh, <laughs> the next time we see each other, I don't know if it's going to be as cool as you, but I'll try. <laughs> I'm in the dark now, dude. I'm in the dark. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Brendan. Guys. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for listening to Social Genius, brought to you by Drunk on Social. We are here to help you take your business to new levels through social media. Make sure to subscribe to get updates on new episodes and come join us on our Drunk on Social Facebook page. And as always, make sure you leave us a great review on your favorite podcast app. Feedback and likes are very much appreciated. 